Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States, Episode 2.2, The Province of Maryland. Welcome back to the Political History of the United States. This week, to begin, I am going to start by correcting an error from last week's episode. During last week's episode, I had been talking about the birthplace of George Fox, and I mentioned it had been in Leicestershire. Well, as it turns out, a listener pointed out that it should have actually been Leicestershire. Now, what threw me off on that one is I had actually been a little uncomfortable with the pronunciation, turned to Google, and that's what Google gave me. And ladies and gentlemen, it appears that Google has done me wrong here. So I apologize for that. This week, however, the entire theme of the episode is going to be correcting mistakes. Because listeners, I made a mistake last season. Specifically, I completely failed to give the province of Maryland any real introduction. I do bring up Maryland briefly in episode 1.13 when discussing the Virginia colony, and at the time, I had fully intended to go back and eventually address Maryland itself. However, as time went on, that never actually happened, and Maryland was essentially forgotten, left to exist as nothing more than a quick five-minute footnote. I am striving to tell a complete story here about the political history of the United States, and totally ignoring a colony isn't going to help me tell that story the way that I intended. So this week, it is time to remedy that oversight. This episode absolutely would have fit better last year. However, that ship has sailed and we need to make do with what we can. This week, therefore, we are going to turn our attention to the province of Maryland. We will take the story a bit further than I would have last season as we've covered a few additional years now. So with that, let's head on over and meet up with Lord Baltimore and explore the province of Maryland. As we have seen in New England, the North American colonies quickly became a refuge for those who were either persecuted or at least had become religiously maligned. While a large part of our story thus far has been about the Puritans and moving forward is going to be increasingly about the Quakers, they are not the only groups facing persecution during the 17th century. Remember that just a century before the Pilgrims landed at Plymouth, England had been a Catholic country. Unsurprisingly, Despite the rise of the Anglican Church, Catholicism remained in England. Throughout the latter half of the 1500s, there are a series of events that increase tensions between the members of the Anglican Church and Catholics. Incidents like the Anglo-Spanish War and an attempt on the life of King James I by Guy Fawkes back in 1605. Well, there is not going to be an arch-villain like William Laud for us to focus on, practicing Catholics did face persecution ranging from fines to far more serious repercussions for priests. And while things did improve some for Catholics during the reign of Charles I, and recall that there are many Puritans who believe that Charles himself may have been a Catholic, things are still very tense. Despite the fact that persecution was relaxed under Charles I, Catholics still viewed their position as tenuous. As was the case with the Puritans, they were particularly open to the idea of potential immigration. George Calvert, the first Lord of Baltimore, was one of those who was interested by this possibility. Baltimore was not actually a Catholic himself until 1625 when he converted. However, considering that both of his parents were Catholic, it is not surprising that he would make such a conversion. Prior to Maryland, Baltimore had dabbled in the colonial game. He had been involved in the Virginia Company through the Earl of Warwick, and he had been pleased with both the potential for profit and the ability to expand his own estate in the New World. Along with the Earl of Warwick, there had been a failed attempt to get a colony established in Newfoundland. However, the weather had made this colony unsuitable, and it was a project that quickly fizzled. With Newfoundland being unsuitable, Baltimore sought out a more temperate place for a new colony. Deciding that he needed to do some ground-level recon, Baltimore went to Virginia in the late 1620s. Unfortunately for him, the colonists in Virginia were less than enthusiastic about a Catholic coming into their colony and denied him entrance. Not to be dissuaded, however, Baltimore does the next best thing and decides to seek his own pattern adjacent to Virginia. Despite some pushback from the Virginia Company, which didn't want a Catholic colony setting up shop so close, Baltimore would get his patent. As with Virginia, which was named after the Virgin and Protestant Queen Elizabeth, Baltimore named his colony of Maryland 
after the current and Catholic Queen Henrietta Maria. Now, the good news for George Calvert is that he does get his patent. The bad news for George Calvert is that unfortunately he died shortly before it was issued, so he would never personally see it. Baltimore's heir, his son Cecil Calvert, would become the second Baron of Baltimore. So yes, from this point forward, when I mention Baltimore, I'm going to be talking about the second Baron of Baltimore, not his now deceased father. The patent received by Baltimore was vastly different from the grant given to the Virginia Company. Maryland was not a colony designed around being a publicly traded company. There was not going to be that structure in place where shareholders really mattered. Baltimore was not attempting to set up a company, rather he wanted to increase his family's personal holdings. Baltimore viewed the charter in place for Jamestown as being largely responsible for the colonies failing to become fiscally viable. Jamestown, if you recall, had basically been hemorrhaging money for years. Baltimore sought to avoid a complicated apparatus like that and wanted personal reign over his new colony. Thankfully for Baltimore, Charles I was willing to oblige and basically went ahead and carved out a small fiefdom for Baltimore. Charles I gave Baltimore control over the area in perpetuity. This was accomplished by establishing what would essentially amount to a feudal structure in the colony. Baltimore would be the leader of the colony and upon his death, his heir would take over and so on and so on it would go. Baltimore had the right to grant lands and titles. He was able to raise money, levy taxes, and do all the other things that one would expect of essentially a monarch. So what did England get back in exchange for this deal? The interesting thing is that the answer is almost nothing beyond the continued fealty of Baltimore. So why on earth would Charles be willing to grant so much power and receive so little in return to a man professing a religion not aligned with the crown? Let's take just a moment and look at that question. First, the religious situation isn't totally shocking. We have discussed in some depth already that Charles himself had an interesting relationship with Catholics. And whether or not he was some closeted Catholic, as many Puritans may have suspected, or if he was just tolerant of them, he had consistently shown toleration of them. Charles was married to an outspoken Catholic in Henrietta Maria, who refused to renounce her faith and embrace the Anglican Church. So in regards to Lord Baltimore's religion, Catholicism was really not that big of a problem. However, what about the absolutely massive grant without getting anything back in return? Lord Baltimore, and for a moment we are going to be talking about the first George Calvert, had been close with King James and had risen all the way to the position of Secretary of State. It was Calvert who had worked so closely with the Spanish trying to arrange the marriage between Charles I and the Spanish Maria Anna. In this regard, Lord Baltimore had always been a close ally of the monarchy. Plus, consider that everything we are looking at right now is going on in the shadow of Charles' period of personal rule. Charles I is doing a fantastic job right around this time of making enemies and alienating people. Sure, we are still several years away from the actual outbreak of civil war, but Charles must have realized that there was indeed some value in loyalty especially in times as uncertain as what he was going through at this time. Keeping Baltimore happy and loyal in exchange for some lands off on the edge of the world? That doesn't seem like nearly as bad of a trade. Baltimore would at least give a small nod to popular representation when he agreed that for legislation he would at least consult with the freemen of the colony or their representatives. Likely, wanting to avoid going too far, this meant that for the people choosing to colonize Maryland, they aren't just hopping on a boat to live under the tyrannical rule of a newly minted despot. Really, the only thing that Baltimore couldn't do is anything that offended the laws of England itself. It took a year and a half for the now younger Lord Baltimore to get together enough people to make the first journey across the Atlantic. Leaving in November of 1633, the first ship would arrive along the Upper Chesapeake in March of 1634. Luckily for the English settlers, they landed amongst two local tribes, the Yea Camacos and the Pescataways. Both these tribes immediately take on friendly overtures towards the settlers, likely wanting to make them allies against their common enemy, the Susquehannock tribe. Not among the first settlers was Lord Baltimore himself, 
but rather his younger brother, Leonard Calvert. It would ultimately be Leonard Calvert that would help establish the colony. Okay, so before we move forward, let's go ahead and once again clarify names. From this point on, unless I state otherwise, if you hear me mention Calvert, I am talking about our baby brother, Leonard Calvert. If you hear me mention Lord Baltimore, I'm talking about the second Lord Baltimore, Cecil Calvert. Got it? Good. Almost immediately, one of the defining traits of the province of Maryland was the religious tolerance that it offered. Baltimore, as we have discussed, was a Catholic, and absolutely was sincere about seeking out a place where Catholics would be able to enjoy a higher degree of freedom than was presently available in England. However, despite his own personal feelings towards religion, the province of Maryland quickly positioned itself as a bastion of religious freedom, something that was still quite rare in the English North American colonies. In Virginia, the Church of England reigned supreme, not to mention the happenings that we are going to see in New England over the next few decades. The religious tolerance that we see come out of Rhode Island is still a few years in the future at this point, and even then, that is going to be a relatively small island of tolerance in a region that was most definitely not tolerant. The obvious question, therefore, becomes why Baltimore and company were as tolerant as they were. How did this toleration lead eventually to the Religious Toleration Act of 1649? The tolerance exhibited in Maryland stands in stark contrast to the norms in other places throughout the colonies, again with the exception of Rhode Island, and that is something that will come to help form the basis of the legacy of the province of Maryland. The origin of religious toleration appears to stem not from any high-minded enlightened thinking, but rather coming out of a desire to increase the profits of the colony. Persecution of Catholics inside of England during the reign of Charles I was really not that bad. Sure, they couldn't officially hold civic positions, but Charles himself seems to have at least been friendly towards the Catholics. Had Baltimore decided that Maryland would be a Catholic haven and that others would not be welcome, it is unlikely that the province of Maryland could have ever become an economically viable colony. Furthermore, by this point, we are in the middle part of the 1630s. We have ample evidence of what is happening when a colony essentially secludes itself off from the world. Up in Plymouth, everybody seemed pretty happy about living in their own isolated universe. However, that is not exactly a money-making endeavor. Baltimore had no interest in not making money from this endeavor. Limiting the colony to only Catholics would have substantially reduced the number of potential colonists. Furthermore, Baltimore was looking for a very specific type of colonist. Wanting to avoid a situation where he depended on shareholders like in Virginia, Baltimore envisioned a world where those coming over were buying land. This means that the people running Maryland would actually have a stake in the colony that was more than simply holding shares in it. We know from Virginia that having your shareholders an ocean away does not make for optimal conditions on the ground and means that those with a financial stake are oftentimes not going to have a clear understanding of the situation inside the colony. Seeking to avoid this, Baltimore wanted people buying parcels of land and settling in Maryland themselves. Ultimately, the vast majority of people coming to Maryland, the Catholic haven of the New World, were in fact not Catholic. Instead, what we see is a mixture of religions coming over, however, predominantly it is Protestant. A large percentage of those entering Maryland were not traveling across the Atlantic, but rather were making the short journey north from Virginia. Those choosing to leave their Virginia homes did so for a variety of reasons, but religion often played a major role in the decision. As a result of this, many of the colonists settling in Maryland were more religiously radical. Virginia stayed steadfastly adherent to the Church of England and balked at influences inside the colony attempting to move away from the established church. While the majority of the Puritans ended up in the north in New England, not all did, and many of those that landed in Virginia would ultimately end up moving to the new Maryland colony. Eventually, this would expand to be more than just the Puritans, as Quakers would also find Maryland to be a suitable home. For Baltimore, the entire purpose of the colony was to expand his own holdings, and even more than a land of religious tolerance, the best way to attract men to your cause is the promise of profits. By the time we reach the 1630s, the tobacco trade is thriving in Virginia, 
Well, that is great for the crown and those growing the tobacco because it means a source of revenue. It also meant that the competition became much higher in Virginia. Maryland was still a new colony, and because of that, it offered less competition and was seen by many as a place where those unable to get a foothold in the competitive Virginia market could make some money. To aid this process, a generous headright system was put into place. If you recall, a headright system is a setup whereby a person who managed to transport themselves and others across the Atlantic got what amounted to a gifted plot of land. In Maryland, for every adult who got themselves across the ocean, there was a 100-acre plot waiting for them. This was regardless of if the person was free or a servant. Children under the age of 16 being brought over by their parents earned an additional 50 acres. So if you have a family of five, two parents plus three kids and two servants, you just made a nice little 550-acre claim. Furthermore, times had changed a lot since 1607. When Jamestown started, one of their biggest challenges to survival was the fact that nobody knew what they were doing. If you recall, you had this mixture of people who had never worked a day in their lives, ordering around the formerly urban poor, who also had zero idea how to grow a farm. The resulting effect of this meant that you ended up with a lot of dead settlers during those early years. Maryland, less anxious to replay the starving time, or frankly anything from the first decade in Jamestown, had a real advantage. A moment ago, I had mentioned that the majority of the colonists were people bailing out of Virginia and moving north. That is going to help the early Maryland colony not only to survive, but slowly begin to thrive. The settlers coming to Maryland had a good idea already of the hardships that colonization brought with it. They knew how to farm, and importantly, they knew how to grow tobacco. As a result, not only does Maryland manage to avoid the painful period of growth that we see in Jamestown, but quickly their cash crop emerges as tobacco, and it grew quite nicely in Maryland. Politically in Maryland, Baltimore was the guy. All power flowed through him, and despite an assembly existing, Baltimore had the power to nullify anything they did. So yeah, there was an assembly and their decisions were binding, just so long as Lord Baltimore was okay with it. As we see in the other colonies, What emerges was a mixture between a direct form of government, where the freemen are personally intending, and a representative assembly. Much as in the other colonies, the decision to have a representative form of government based in Maryland was not born out of any enlightened ideals, but was rather a function of logistics. Namely, following a dispute over Kent Island, Baltimore and his men had to take the island from Virginia by force. Border disputes would become an ongoing problem for the province of Maryland. When New England had been established, it was nowhere near Virginia. With the province of Maryland, however, the settlement was right next door to Virginia, which had been growing and expanding for decades now. With this expansion, borders had become blurry around the edges. When the province of Maryland came along right next door to Virginia, these unclear borders suddenly became a major problem. No place was this more of an issue than on Kent Island. Kent Island is an island in the Chesapeake to the southeast of Baltimore, basically due east of Annapolis. In May of 1631, William Claiborne received permission from England to develop Kent Island as a trading station. When Baltimore got his patent and Kent Island was included inside the new province of Maryland, Claiborne was less than thrilled. The primary complaint that he had is that under the patent that Baltimore had received, Claiborne was now going to have to obtain a license from Baltimore to continue to trade from the post that he had developed. For Claiborne, this would be like building a nice big custom house for himself, and then suddenly being told that a guy who had nothing to do with the work he had put in was now going to be his landlord. Claiborne had no interest in going from having rights over Kent Island to being a tenant on his own land. Now, arguments did arise as to what Claiborne's actual claim was. Arguments were made that he didn't actually control the land, but rather just possessed a license from the crown to trade on that spot. However, from Claiborne's position, this was merely a question of semantics. It was his land and he did not plan to leave it. Unwilling to accept that he was now a subject of the province of Maryland, Claiborne held out. Claiborne's first move was to go ahead and arm his ships that were coming in and out of Kent Island. There is not much good having a trading post if you are under constant threat of having your ships seized. What leads out of this was a series of small skirmishes between Claiborne's ships and ships belonging to Calvert. 
In the first battle, Marilyn secured a narrow victory. However, shortly thereafter, Claiborne would score his own victory over Marilyn in a battle near the mouth of the Potomac. The victory by Claiborne would basically end the issue temporarily. Baltimore stopped pressing the issue and Claiborne was free to continue trading unimpeded. So why does Baltimore back off? Well, the record isn't great on his thinking here. However, there are some decent guesses we can make. Baltimore has a brand new colony he is trying to establish. The last thing he is going to want is ongoing skirmishes with Claiborne disrupting his attempt to settle the region. Furthermore, Baltimore may have well realized that given time, defeating Claiborne would become a far simpler task. Claiborne did have the nominal backing of Virginia for his claim, but ultimately they were going to have little interest in crossing the crown. In this way, Claiborne was on a literal and figurative island. When Maryland was small and just starting up, he was able to resist their efforts to take the island. However, without the backing of Virginia, ultimately Claiborne was always going to have a problem maintaining control over Kent Island. For Baltimore, it was a game of timing more than anything else. Sure, in 1632-33, he wasn't going to be strong enough to take the island, but that would not be the case forever. For Baltimore, the best play was to put this issue on the back burner, establish the colony, grow stronger, and then deal with Kent Island. Sure enough, in April of 1635, Baltimore launched his attack. With relative ease, Baltimore's forces were able to capture Claiborne's ships and expel him from the island. This does not totally end the dispute, however, as Claiborne is going to return to Kent Island two more times, seize the island, and two more times have to be forced out again. It is not until 1658 that Claiborne is kicked off the island for good. As an interesting side note, Virginia continued to officially hold the position that the island was their territory right up until 1776. After Baltimore seized Kent Island in 1635, the colonists there were going to want their due representation in the legislature. However, due to the location of the island, getting to the assembly at St. Mary's was difficult on a practical level. This leads the colonists on the island to send a representative to put forth their interests instead of them trying to personally make it to the assembly. This, of course, really had become the story across the colonies. We see representative assemblies spread throughout the colonial United States. As we move on in our story, we are going to continue to see the growth and evolution of the representative form of government, which eventually is going to accumulate in the Continental Congress. Interestingly, in this case, one of the first acts we see passed, and one that Baltimore intelligently wasn't about to veto, was an oath of loyalty towards Charles I. The concern in England is that the colonies were going to become a haven for radicals, which is something that the Maryland colonists hope to avoid. I mention this because we are obviously looking for trends here that are going to explain the road to the revolution. However, this stands as a reminder that in the 1640s, independence just isn't something that was on their radar. As was the case in Virginia, Maryland quickly grew into an area dominated by colonists who owned large tracts of land with an economy centered around tobacco. Likewise, it wasn't 1607 anymore and the colonists understood that while profits are wonderful, growing food is also something that's probably worth doing. The colonists now had decades of knowledge from Jamestown at their disposal, and Maryland quickly thrived. Things did become far more tenuous during the early part of the 1640s, however. Leonard Calvert did return to England during 1642 in what was the early phases of the English Civil Wars. With Baltimore, who was seemingly loyal to Charles, unable to get his correspondence across the Atlantic, and Leonard having traveled back home, Maryland was essentially left without any meaningful leadership. With anti-Catholic sentiments running high, people were quick to take advantage of this situation. With Baltimore and his brother Leonard Calvert now all the way across the Atlantic, there was a vacuum that suddenly appeared in Maryland's leadership. Inside of Maryland, it was Richard Engel, a colonist and tobacco trader who decided to step into the void. Engel quickly sees St. Mary's in the name of the Protestants. Also, and I'm guessing this does not come with much shock, William Claiborne seized on this opportunity and quickly retook Kent Island, something that he wasted exactly zero seconds doing. It would take nearly two years for Leonard to regain full control over the colony, 
and he would only actually manage it with help from Governor Berkeley in Virginia. The period of infighting between the Catholics and the Protestants that occurred in the colony over the two-year period made Baltimore realize that change was needed. The answer came in the form of a document promising religious toleration in the colony. The act concerning religion did several things. First, and most importantly, it was a method whereby Baltimore could prove that he was not an enemy to the now post-Civil War, fully Protestant England. 1649 was not a wonderful time to be at the head of a supposed Catholic haven. That was the kind of thing that would draw unwanted attention towards Baltimore. This bill therefore promised that his colony would offer full religious tolerance to Christians, which was meant to pacify Parliament that this was not a Catholic colony. At the same time, however, there was pragmatic reasons for this as well. Maryland never really became the Catholic refuge that Baltimore had intended, and it had always been overwhelmingly Protestant. This act, on its face, was meant to protect the minority group within the colony. What really, however, made this a master stroke of genius is that the Catholics were in fact that minority group. It was always the Protestants who had been the majority. What Baltimore was able to do here was pass an act where he was seemingly giving lip service to protecting the rights of the Protestants, well, in actuality, protecting the rights of that minority group of Catholics. The situation in Maryland would grow more muddled during the 1650s when the English forces came and attempted to seize control of Virginia. Virginia, if you recall from last season, had remained steadfast in their loyalty to Charles I and upon his death to House Stuart. While the loyalties of Maryland were more ambiguous than what was going on in Virginia, Maryland, unfortunately, was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Combined with an influx of Puritan seeking toleration under the newly enacted Act Concerning Religion, Maryland quickly fell under Puritan control. Baltimore was able to maintain authority in portions of the colony, while Puritans, seeking to form a society like New England, controlled the rest. Baltimore eventually made his pleas for help to Oliver Cromwell personally. Cromwell obviously was aware that he had to keep the major lords of England happy, and had little interest in getting on the wrong side of Baltimore. He was tired of war and was not terribly interested in starting another one. At the same time, Cromwell, a Puritan himself, viewed the American Puritans as often acting excessively. A compromise was eventually reached, which saw Cromwell reinstate Baltimore into power, while at the same time getting Baltimore to agree to a full pardon for those who had seized the colony. As a result, the Maryland Puritans begrudgingly accepted the act concerning religion. Politically, this is how the situation is going to stay for the near future in Maryland. Maryland would remain tolerant of all Christian religions and would manage to avoid becoming a Puritan haven. At the same time, however, Maryland never does become the Catholic colony either. Protestants always outnumbered the Catholics by a relatively large margin. Okay. With that, I think we have Maryland on solid enough footing that we can move forward in our story and not be totally lost when we return there in time. With this mistake remedied, we can move forward and spend the next few episodes introducing the Carolinas. So, I will see you all back here in two weeks' time, and we will dive into the Carolinas and get another colony up on its feet. I appreciate you all listening, and I will see you back here in two weeks'.